surprisingly enough, that's me, uh, I'm, and that's what I'm here to talk about. So hopefully you guys are here to hear about that. If not, you know, feel free, go learn something else. Um, my name's Drew, I'm with Toradex, uh, and uh, I'm here to talk about containers, but specifically containers built using open embedded and how we do that, and, and more importantly, why in the world would you want to do that? Um, so basically, the, I've got a lot of material here, uh, probably more than can be covered reasonably in the amount of time we have, because this is a big topic, and I know there's a lot of different uh, uh, expectations and uh, experience levels of people with it when it comes to containers, especially in the embedded world. So really want to just kind of, I've got some overview stuff about containers, why containers are in embedded, how we use them at Toradex, and then talk about how to do that specifically with Open Embedded with some uh, specific examples. I have code snippets and that kind of thing. I don't have a completely functional demo that I can just hand you in a Git repo, but copy and pasting from the code sample should get you up and running as long as you have a, a usable Open Embedded configuration. And finally, I want to talk a little bit about meta virtualization at the end, uh, which is where a lot of the, the new technologies in the open embedded uh, Yakko space are coming in uh, when it comes to all things uh, virtualization, not just containers. Um, quick disclaimer, I've only ever used Docker for anything. I, I know there's other options out there. I know very little about them. I'm happy to discuss it. If you, anybody has any specific feedback, I'd love to hear it. Um, and uh, most importantly, this is not, I'm not putting together a production ready secure system here. So don't, don't take what I do and go ship it and then call me and yell at me later because I haven't even given that a second thought on these things. So. Uh, obligatory marketing slide, we make hardware, we make software. Uh, Terizon is uh, just a little background. As the impetus of this talk, we have a container-based distro that we provide for our, our customers. And we get the question all the time, you know, how do I make my container smaller? How do I do proper license checking and that kind of thing? Um, so if, you, if you're used to the Docker world and you pull things from Docker Hub, uh, you know, there's certainly some shady things out there. There are some good ones out there. Um, so I got to thinking about it and looking at the things you could do with Open Embedded to be able to actually build the containers directly, and that's kind of where the, the idea for this talk came from. All right, for a moment, let's pretend we're on a Zoom web call. I just want to kind of get an idea of who knows what about containers here. So if everybody knows all the basics, we can blow right past that. I've got the obligatory picture of a, a storage container. Any talk where you're talking about uh, Docker or anything like that, that's mandated. So make sure you add that. So first question, have you ever used containers at all? Or maybe more importantly, who has never even launched a container? Okay, I figured that was the right answer there. All right, have you ever used them on an embedded device? Okay, pretty good number still. Uh, have you ever tried any, anything on a commercial offering similar to Terizon? Uh, 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 Belana's got one, there's probably half a dozen of them out there. Okay, numbers are smaller again. What about directly through Open Embedded? Okay. And finally, are you a meta, meta virtualization contributor or maintainer? Okay, so why are you here? <laughs> you're not, Tim, you're not going to learn anything from me. <laughs> I can tell you that right now. Okay, so everybody's used containers. Let's talk a little bit just for a few minutes about what they are and what they are not. I, I think that's always an uh, important way to start. So first thing, they're not virtual machines. It took me a long time when I started playing with Docker to really... Uh, divorce my mind from the idea that these were lightweight virtual machines. Yes, most people come into it, at least with my background, they come in thinking, okay, this is a lightweight virtual machine, and it kind of does that. You can kind of think about it like that. Kind of gives you an idea of what it is. They're not universal applications. Yes, you can run Docker on Windows, you can run Docker on Mac, but uh, typically under the cover, there's a Linux VM of some kind running these applications for you. You don't have to know about that, but it's, it, that's the case. And also, they're not magic. All right, this is standard Linux stuff. But what they are is a convenient way to package software with all the dependencies that, that your application needs. And it, it, it gives you a very convenient way to ensure a very consistent runtime for your, your software. So if you need a specific version of, I don't know, an MQTT library, you put that in your container, what's in the host OS is irrelevant. You're not touching what's in the host OS. If you want to run another container right next to yours that needs a different, maybe incompatible version of MQTT, so be it, you do that, right? So that's, that is ultimately what the, the intent of containers is for. So difference between virtual machines and containers, as you see here, Containers, uh, typically you're going to have multiple processes running in the same system. Each of these would be considered a container. But the, the, the important thing is they share the kernel. Whereas with a virtual machine, 
the kernel is actually part of the virtual machine and you're, hypervi you're uh, virtualized at a lower level. So that's a kind of an important distinction to, to, to make. And a lot of times you'll run containers on top of, vir of a virtual machine and sometimes you might even you know, have a, a, a much more uh, inception-like view of the world where you're running containers in a container on top of a virtual machine and it, uh, it gets complicated very quickly. So I wanted to bring up this slide. Uh, I usually include this. Uh, normally I would have this just as a direct link to Docker's description. It's a very long page. It's actually a pretty good description of what containers are. Uh, for whatever reason, the, the, Outlook, the um, PowerPoint plugin to pull live websites is not working for me, so I just went ahead and grabbed a screenshot. If you really want to look at it, there's the link there. So how do we make containers? What are, what are the things uh, that, that, that are used to build a container? And for the most part, they're just standard Linux features, right? Things like namespaces and C groups are ways to limit what your individual processes can see or do in a system, right? And uh, things like networking components, you, you, can, you can have software bridges and things like that. So there's not a whole lot of building blocks in the container world that are not standard kernel mechanisms. And what's important about that is that means when you are running containers on top of a Linux system, you are running standard Linux kernel processes. They are scheduled by the Linux kernel scheduler, just like any other process. They just might have some limitations in the task control block that are, that are managed by the kernel. So there's not, and this is one of the very first questions we always get from uh, more deeply embedded folks coming to the container world. There's not a separate scheduler in there that adds overhead to your runtime. You're, it's the same as if the containers were running natively on the kernel. Now, that said, you can still implement containers poorly and have uh, performance issues that way, but uh, you can do that when you're running natively as well. So it, it, there's nothing inherent in these, Docker, in these container setups that's going to uh, uh, add additional runtime overhead. There is some storage overhead, typically a little bit of initialization overhead as everything gets set up and running, but at, at steady state, at runtime, uh, you're usually in pretty good shape. Um, just to mention a few implementations, Docker, I've obviously mentioned that one already. LXC is, uh, I think, an older technology. Uh, it's just a container technology that's been in Linux for a long time. Uh, I don't know, I, I must have mistyped something there because I don't know what run is, but uh, systemd inspawn is actually part of systemd. You can actually uh, launch containers directly from the systemd system uh, if you're running that, and there are ways you can actually, I, I've seen some, some posts where you can actually use systemd inspawn to basically run a container of your entire operating system. Um, and it, uh, it, your head hurts if you think too hard about it, but I know the systemd guys use that a lot for their actual development. So they have their, you know, they don't mess up their main system, but they're still able to install new things and, and try new things without having to jump through too many hoops. So just a few, th few things you'll see. LXC, I know uh, Open Embedded has good support for it. Uh, oh, that was supposed to be run C. That's what that was supposed to be. There's another, there's another uh, container runtime, again, one that I know nothing about, uh, but uh, I know that uh, it is available in meta-virtualization. So what are the high-level benefits? This is, these are the kind of questions we get from our, our customers and typically from the, you know, the management types at, at the customers. Why would I care about this? The biggest thing is no dependency hell. We all know that dependency hell is a thing. Uh, there, there's a link here uh, that, that's kind of fun to look through. But as I mentioned, if you need incompatible versions of things, you can do that. It, it, it's all managed directly by the, uh, the, the container runtime. For, from our perspective, the biggest thing we get out of containers is convenient packaging and delivery of, thing, of things to the system. So we use the container to implement over-the-air updates for the application stack. You know, it's all built into Docker to be able to say, create me an image that has all these things in it. We didn't have to reinvent all that. So we were able to take advantage of that and uh, be able to use that convenient packaging and delivery. It is standards based, um, and you know, I'm sure, I know it didn't, it didn't work very well, rotated 90 degrees, but uh, we do what we can. Uh, so there are lots of standards. Uh, we, there are some other standards that we're gonna look at here uh, that, that are well implemented and well supported. Another thing, especially in the embedded space, is all the modern DevOps workflows, right? The embedded space tends to kind of lag behind some of the, the, some of the more enterprise uh, web type things and the ability to, to you know, do a git push and have a whole chain of things happen to, to, to build and deploy and test your code automatically. The container, containerized uh, workloads 
they, they lend themselves to that very well. And that's one of the big uh, selling points that we try to provide with our system is that our users can then go and uh, you know, quickly deploy things, uh, you know, get their nightly builds automatically deployed to the hardware so that when their developers start in the morning, they've got the very latest and don't have to spend a whole lot of time jumping through hoops there. And uh, there's lots of readily available software. I just picked a, a, a few random logos here from things I found on Docker Hub. Uh, it's very easy to go out to Docker Hub and say, you know, launch me a MongoDB instance. And you don't have to know anything about MongoDB other than copying and pasting from a, a blog post somewhere. And now you're able to run, uh, you know, whatever, whatever software you want. I've got some blog posts about using uh, MotionEye, which is a uh, webcam monitoring software for, for uh, surveillance cameras, things like that. It's very easy to set these things up. I probably have a dozen different containerized workloads on my home network doing various things, home assistant and uh, PyHole DNS and things like that. So certainly for those kind of things, it makes it very convenient. So that's more of the high level stuff. Now this picture, I kind of like this picture. It kind of gives an idea the whole idea of microservices and the ability to split things up into multiple blocks, right? That, that's very well supported and that's very much the common use case for containers. Um, we talked about the dependencies. That's, that, you know, from the technical perspective, that's probably the, the, the biggest one. The ability to define these multiple multi-service architectures uh, does allow for each individual service potentially to be simplified over a, a whole monolithic system where you were putting everything in a single block. And another very useful thing for a lot of our customers, especially who are maybe not familiar with the Octo Open Embedded, they're used to coming from a desktop world, you can actually basically just say Docker run Ubuntu, and you're in a shell prompt in an almost complete Ubuntu system, except you're just sharing the kernel with whatever your base operating system is. So you can do apt installs and all kinds of things, which our, our, develop, our customers really like because they can get started quickly. They know how to do stuff on their desktop, they can do very similar things uh, in, the, in their embedded workloads. Um, and uh, a lot of people get uh, hung up on the isolation uh, portion provided by containers, so those C groups of things that we talked about. There is some isolation involved. Uh, it does provide a level of protection beyond just running things in the base operating system. Uh, it's not as uh, secure as, say, a full uh, hypervisor setup, but it is better than, be better than uh, running things natively and being able to see the entire root file system and things like that. Typical objections, runtime performance hit. I already discussed that. Uh, it's pretty much, pretty much the same. What is the increased uh, storage and RAM? The, there is typically some extra storage needed. Uh, if you're using Docker in particular, they have a layering mechanism that largely mitigates that. So if I have two containers that are based on the same components, they share those components and I don't have to download everything twice. Uh, so you, you've gotta be a little bit careful how you structure these things, but uh, they're not terribly complicated. Uh, other technical objections we get a lot are, my people don't know this, it's new, uh, but it's quicker to learn this than to become a, a, a Yocto open embedded expert. So uh, we, we, we think we've got a, a good answer for that. And some people think that the overall design complexity when you're dealing with multiple blocks in a microservices architecture, the overall design complexity might be a little bit bigger, even if each individual unit might be a little bit simpler. So those are some of the objections we get. And specifically as it comes to embedded, what are the concerns? Start of time, runtime performance. Uh, those, the, they're not specific, unique to embedded, but uh, those are very common concerns we get. You know, how do I define the, the multiple services? What are, what are the languages uh, that I use? You need to learn Docker Compose. You need to learn YAML to be able to specify that multiple service architecture. But mo the, the biggest concern we get is how do I get access to hardware? I'm inside a container. I'm kind of virtualized. I don't have direct access. Fortunately, for you know, in the Linux system, typically everything is a file. So as long as you map the, the device node into your container, you can generally access it. You might have to give some extra permissions and that kind of thing. Uh, the, the container systems will have uh, the ability to specify capabilities and things like that. Um, there are some more complicated things like getting access to the display. Uh, we actually have some reference containers that we provide that show you how to run Wayland and, and, and actually light up a display and do things all from within containers. So we have yet to find anything uh, that our customers have wanted to do inside a container that they couldn't do with the, the capabilities provided by the container runtime we're using. So what are the benefits? Uh, for the developers, it's that uh, familiar environment, apt install, whatever they're used to. Um, 
I mentioned over the air updates, un completely unattended updates in the field of the application stacks are well supported by uh, container workloads. workloads. Um, it does give you an increased pool of potential application developers, right? If you're, if you're out uh, interviewing strictly for uh, people that have experience with Yocto, you get a much smaller pool than if you go and say, I want somebody who's used Docker. So from a management perspective, that's a good thing. And it does, in some ways, make it easier to, to do your, your development, say, on your desktop, get it working there, and then easily port it over to your embedded device uh, for, you know, for later on testing. Um, so I just wanted to mention a couple things that uh, I came across in my research. I haven't spent a whole lot of time with them, uh, but these are useful container resources and tools. Open Container Initiative is primarily a standards effort uh, to, to define standard formats for the containers. Uh, there, there is support in meta virtualization for building OCI compliant containers and things like that. I couldn't get it to work. Uh, there's some, some build errors or something that I was unable to troubleshoot at the moment, um, but, uh, but that's out there and that's, helping, uh, that's certainly helping to drive some compatibility across these uh, container runtimes. Um, Podman is uh, it's a, a, a daemonless container runtime that's basically uh, command line uh, API compatible with Docker. So a lot of people that uh, use that, they just say alias Docker equals Podman, and they don't even have to know they're running Do Podman instead of Docker. Um, Builda is a, it's, it's a tool for building container images, kind of similar to what we're doing with Open Embedded, so I didn't spend a lot of time on that. And then Scopio is uh, just a tool for copying images around, converting them from one format to another, and things like that. And with my thanks, I, uh, most of the material I pulled in here was, came from one of these three talks, either Scott, Robert, or Bruce. Uh, they go into a lot more detail about the mechanics and the specifics. I wanted to kind of cover the more higher level and, and the, the I'm just getting started as a beginner level. So if you, I encourage you to spend time with these talks. Uh, if, if you, uh, if you want to learn more, especially Bruce's talk there, he gives a lot of motivation and uh, goals for the future, which I think was a, a very helpful overview to figure out what's going on uh, in the meta, meta virtualization world. So how do we create containers? So this is a standard Docker file. This is kind of the Docker way, right? You create a Docker file and you tell it what you want to do. So we start with a from. Typically, we'll, we'll start with from, which says I'm going to inherit from some already existing container. In this case, I'm pulling one of the, uh, the, the Crops Yocto uh, containers that's uh, based on Ubuntu 20, so I've got a full Ubuntu setup. Um, and then I can basically, within this Docker container, I'm, I'm modifying the image. I'm making my changes so, you know, I, I actually have a local Docker file where I add, add things that I like in my container. You can see I'm running APT commands there, uh, installing things. I'm uh, pulling down git, L, git LFS. So, so at the end of running Docker build with this Docker file, now I have a customized version of the image. Right, and it's very flexible, very easy to use, and, and pretty pretty uh, self-explanatory. The, the the syntax for these files is not terribly complicated, um, and you can do a lot with it. Um, but that from line is the scary part of this, right? Now I'm pulling from a, a a reasonably trusted source here, and they're pulling from a reasonably trusted source. But as we've all heard, uh, you know, with the uh, supply chain uh, issues with things like PyPy getting, uh, get, getting bad code injected into it and things like that, these kind of things can be scary, right? You're pulling essentially pre-built binaries from somewhere on the internet and you're running your stuff on it. For my local containers at home, probably not a big deal. If I'm shipping, uh, you know, a million units and I, you know, have to support it for 15 years, that can be a little, uh, that can be a little bit uh, dodgy. So uh, that's the big thing that scares me on that. So the majority of the functionality in Open Embedded that I, that I used for, for, for developing this is actually in uh, Meta Open Embedded. It's not in Meta, meta Virtualization. So there's this image container BV class uh, that's pretty, th this is the entire class. It's not a terribly complicated thing. It sets up a few things. It clears out some of the, the, the kernel related things that you're not going to need in a container. Um, it, it says that you need a tar.bz2 file, which is essentially just a, a tar.bz2 version of your container. And then just some extra error checking and things like that. You want to make sure you're using uh, the Linux dummy uh, kernel as your preferred provider so that you're not uh, building a full kernel and things like that. Um, and, and with this uh, image container class, you're actually able to build 
any uh, container you want based on just about any kind of uh, Yocto build package that you have, you might have. So this is the first thing I tried to set up. So in my local.conf, I simply specify I'm building a container FS type. Uh, I set that preferred provider for the kernel so that I'm not uh, dealing with the full kernel. And then I had a custom image, which is a pretty, pretty basic image. It inherits from image. And all I'm installing here is BusyBox. Now, because uh, Open Embedded tracks dependencies, the nice thing is I don't have to manually specify them. This, and I do my BitBake build here. It's going to pull BusyBox in anything that it needs to be able to build. So in this case, I'm doing a, a build for Chemo ARM64. Right, just because that's kind of the lowest common denominator of ARM64 compatibility. I didn't have to do anything crazy with building a custom, uh, custom machine or anything like that. And at the end of the build, inside the deploy directory, I actually have my BusyBox container tar file here. I simply copy that over to my uh, hardware. Now, in this case, my hardware is actually running uh, to Ryzen, so it already has the, the, the Docker runtime on it. So we'll, we'll talk about how to get the Docker runtime on it in just a bit. But assuming you already have a Linux system uh, with, with Docker on it, now that I've copied that tar, tar file over, I, for, with Docker, I simply do a Docker import, give it a name, and now you see in my list of images, I actually have many, minimal BusyBox, seven megs, I, and I can run it. Now, there's not an exec command t that, that's uh, in the Docker file. One of the things you would typically specify is an entry point, uh, which is the default command that will run when you, when you launch an image. Uh, the way these are generated, you actually have to specify the command. So in this case, I just simply say run, uh, run sh. So now I'm actually running bash in a container on my, on my ARM64 system. One interesting thing you can do if you build for, uh, you know, x86-64 or whatever your desktop machine is, you can actually run these containers on your desktop machine. And you get very, very small containers, uh, typically that won't have a whole lot of in them and may not do a whole lot for you. But you can do that. It's kind of fun. So this was kind of how I started was, OK, if people are going to be building, if people with Yocto experience want to do this, they're used to building images. You can actually do a full image and run it in a container. So in this case, I'm actually just running core image full command line. right? I've got the same config that we had previously with the, the image FS type set to container. There's probably a lot more in that image than is appropriate to be in, in a container. Uh, but because we, we've explicit, explicitly stubbed out the kernel stuff, so we know we're OK there. And the, the, the one thing I did differently this time is instead of copying that archive over to my device and doing a Docker import, I actually pushed it up through Docker Hub. In this case, I pushed it to my namespace on Docker Hub. So from the, from the board, uh, it looks just like any other Docker container. It, the, you know, my board is able to go to the Docker Hub or whatever repository I have set up, and it's able to pull down that container that I built. And now I'm able to run, and I'm actually in a core image full command line uh, build. So like I said, this is kind of how I envisioned our, our users that were wanting to migrate to this approach to do that, because they, most of them already have an image of some kind so that you know, they can get, get that up and running on top, of, uh, on top of our system pretty quickly. And then over time, they can kind of pull things out, re-architect it, look at what's in the image that they may no longer need that's now provided by the base operating system uh, and, and be able to get up and running pretty quickly. So the next thing is, uh, you know, how do you want to make it a little bit smaller? The simplest answer, typically, when you're dealing with Yocto Open Embedded, is to use Muscle. Uh, one ch one line change in your uh, local.conf, you rebuild. You can see some of the differences here. Uh, adding Python in didn't make a huge amount of difference, surprisingly. I thought it would be more than that. But you can see down here, if you've got that container with just BusyBox, we dropped uh, quite significantly. So this is a, a big concern a lot of our users have is because you know, when they're deploying updates to their application, they want that as small as possible. Um, so you know, depending on, on how much is in their application, switching over to Muscle might be a little easier. This is obviously something that you would have a much harder time doing with standard Docker mechanisms, right? Because most of those images that you build from are, are going to be glibc based. Uh, the biggest thing you could do is switch from, uh, say, a, a Debian variant as your base to something like Alpine Linux, which is based on Muscle. You'll see that a lot of the uh, containers uh, that you find on Docker Hub are going to be based on Alpine because of that. 
So I mentioned meta virtualization, uh, and uh, that Bruce gave me permission to, to, to steal the slide. He did want me to give the warning that this is about six months out of date, and he's got an updated version. Uh, and I don't know all the details of everything in meta, meta virtualization, obviously, but this kind of gives you an idea of all the things that are included in there. It's a lot more than just containers. Uh, it, it's all sorts of uh, you know hypervisors and things like that. Uh, and you can kind of get a get 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 an idea from the, the 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 timeline here of what was available when there. But uh, you know, if you start using uh, this stuff with Open Embedded, you will eventually need to use uh, meta virtualization. So that kind of gives you an idea of what's there. So that leads into how do I build a Yocto configuration that can run these images? Okay, so we want to build Docker into the image, right? So it's pretty straightforward. We add meta virtualization, which brings in a few other uh, layer dependencies. Um, we turn on virtualization uh, in distro features, which may not strictly be necessary for Docker, uh, but uh, I figured it didn't hurt to have it. And then we just say simply uh, add, add Docker. Couple options, you can switch to Docker Mobi, you can switch to Podman. Uh, I, think, I think Docker Mobi is really just a fork. It's the open source version of the Docker CE, something like that. So functionally, it's equivalent. I, could, I couldn't tell you what the differences were. Uh, uh, everything I've tried to do, it worked just as well in any of those three options, Docker CE, uh, Docker Mobi, or Podman. And then uh, you can see here on the, the, the running Kimu system, now I'm at, in this case, I'm actually running Docker CE. You see the version number there. And then information about the Docker server. So if I was running Podman, obviously there would be no server. That's one of the potential benefits of using something like Podman. So a lot of the, the, the next question really is, why do we want to jump through all these hoops, right? We can just simply go create a Docker file and run it. I kind of alluded to some of these things, but uh, there's a couple things to, to, to explicitly point out. Reproducibility and repeatability of builds. This is one of the things that Yocto does better than any other system I've used, right? I want to know that I'm building a system that I ship to my customers, and if they come back to me in two years with a support issue, I can come back and do a complete exact same build of my two-year-old version. Right, Yocto allows me to store the downloads, the estate cache, all that kind of stuff. So I have exactly the same bits uh, that I had two years ago. If you're using Docker, uh, Docker Hub stuff and you're not careful, it's very easy to uh, lose control of that because you're, you're dependent on so many other sources for, for caching that information. There are probably tools uh, and things. I know there's a lot of uh, development in that space. There are probably tools that allow you to do that. Uh, but this is my hammer, uh, so I know how to use this one. And it can be completely self-hosted. So that's what, kind of what I just said about you know, saving those downloads, saving that S8 cache, right? At, at some point, I can cut off my network connectivity and do a complete rebuild because I've downloaded everything that was needed in the first place. So uh, that's obviously important. There are plenty of uh, uh, customers where you know, they're not allowed to have network access on their systems, so they have to kind of do this all in a staging area, and then they package it up and, and do most of their work in a, in a completely network isolated environment. Uh, and, and then the other big item is source archival and uh, software bill of material stuff, right? Uh, if I go pull Docker Ubuntu, you know, even if it's the, the official image sponsored and hosted by Canonical, if I download that, how do I get back to the actual sources that created that? Uh, again, there may be a way. I don't know how to do it. So this is obviously very important for long term uh, of, your, of, of your product and, and, and life cycle. And even more importantly, license tracking and compliance. I think we're all familiar with that. Uh, Yocto does a very good job of creating a manifest of what licenses are in there. It does a great job of allowing you to restrict what licenses you're allowed to even include so that if I say no GPL v3 and I try to build something GPL v3, it'll throw an error. Kind of hard to do that with pre-built binaries from uh, Docker Hub. And just in general, allowing you better visibility into what goes in there, right? Uh, you can go into to your, your metadata, your recipes, and you can configure things, turn things on and off with much more granularity than you, than you can do when you're downloading pre-built binary stuff. So all the package configs and things like that that are standard functionality within Yocto, you can do that here and still be able to use them as containers. So 
you know, that was about it for the content, uh, the, you know, in terms of the demos and things. Just real quick, and then we'll have a few minutes for questions. Um, future work to make this more usable, setting up some kind of container repository. You know, Docker makes it very easy to, to host your own, uh, and then figuring out, you know, what a usable set of containers would be uh, for any particular application stack. Okay, so Docker Hub obviously has everything in the world. Typically, uh, if you're going to be building uh, with Open Embedded, you're probably not gonna have nearly that many things. BitBig World uh, probably is a, a bit more than you want as well. So you've gotta kind of balance that based on your application needs. Um, th the next thing for me is to test this end-to-end -end in some kind of production system. Obviously, in my case, it would be Terizon. I've done some you know, manual testing here where I launched containers from the command line, but I wanna actually go back figure out, okay, let me set up the, that repository and actually be able to use that as my uh, over-the-air uh, deployment of applications and containers to my, uh, to my devices so that when I hand this off to a customer, they can, they can use this in the context of, in, in the context of Terizon. Um, also, I wanna investigate, this may, may be overkill using a proper machine config instead of Kimu. Uh, whether that's going to make any difference or not in these containers uh, is hard to say. Um, you know, a lot of the containers you download from Docker Hub, they're not going to be uh, built very specifically optimized for the SOC and everything that I have on my chips. So this may or may not make a, make a huge amount of difference, but it's uh, relatively uh, low-hanging fruit to be able to, to, to play with that. And then, uh, you know, I did that build of Core Image Full Command Line. I'm, as I said, I'm sure there's a lot of stuff in there that can be stripped out, so I'd like to kind of take a look at that, see about what, what is the minimum amount of stuff I need uh, to be able to, to, to build that. I know some of the, the other talks I've looked at, they went in depth in there, and there was definitely some things in there that could be removed. So, that, so that's kind of one of the next steps. And then this is the big one, is investigating this multi-config setup. So one of the things that a lot of the, and I've seen probably half a dozen different approaches to do this, is how do I do a Yocto build that includes the base OS and the containers and then kind of bundles them together at the end, right? It seems like today the, the, the canonical way to do that is to use a multi-config setup where you, you know, one of your old multi-configs is the base operating system and the other is the container uh, and the container payloads. And then, you know, the dependencies are set up so that the base operating system includes the container payloads. Um, for our Terizon system, it may or may not be interesting. We distribute Terizon with reference containers, and then our customers use our external tooling to actually bundle in their own containers. So uh, the multi-config stuff for our, our uh, commercial usage is probably not all that interesting, but uh, that's kind of the way it seems to be going. I've also seen some other uh, mechanisms for people to do this, um, but uh, I see some shaking heads that seem to indicate that this is the, the, the kind of the best practice right now. And I know that, uh, that uh, Bruce has some ideas and uh, some, some goals to make it even, uh, even easier in the future. And as I mentioned, I was playing with the OCI uh, container types. Uh, to try to you know start playing with some of the other container runtimes, run CLXC and that kind of thing. I couldn't get it to build. I want to figure out why. Uh, there's a few other uh, folks that have posted some reference builds with it, so I just need to go look at theirs, figure out you know what stupid mistake I made, and correct it, and then uh, get it out, to get it tested and working. So there may be future uh, in, uh, future versions of this talk, and. Uh, and for me specifically, I want to learn more about what's in meta virtualization. There's a lot in there, um, and, and specifically the OCI container stuff that's in there. So that's a, just kind of a, a, a sneak peek at you know, maybe what next year's version of this talk will be about, uh, and, and, and hopefully we can uh, uh, we will, uh, get something more interesting. So with that, I think we got about uh, six minutes for questions. Uh, anybody got any questions? Yeah, go ahead, Tim. So, is this on? Is the, do we have the uh, mic on up here? Is it on? There, now it is. Okay. Um, so, as you indicated, there's been a, a number of talks on this. Yes. And I'm wondering, with your fresh eyes, what kind of opportunities we have for documentation, since we also have one of our big documentation folks here in the front row. Um, <laughs> So you know that's that's Agreed. probably that's probably an open question, right? But yes. you know, it, 
you, can you think of ways to do that? And then um, well, just in general, I mean, documentation on this in the informal documentation would be nice. You know, meta virtualization doesn't seem to have, it seems to be a lot of tribal knowledge, a lot of mailing list posts, and a lot of YouTube videos, but, you know, no formal documentation that I could find. There was some stuff, you know, scattered throughout the source code, uh, but even that, there wasn't any, you know, canonical how-tos or anything like that. So I would love to see something like that where, you know, when I started the research for this, I would have found two or three posts that kind of laid it all out because, um, you know, image container BB class isn't very complicated. Uh, but uh, I don't know that there's a, a an actual how-to uh, anywhere for that. So, uh, and and for you know others here who have uh, even less experience with it than I do, you know, if that's something you guys would like, uh, please let, you know let us know, I, and uh, you know we definitely want to get this better moving forward. Okay, if there's no other questions. The second part of it is um, for your customers. It sounds like they're pretty com comfortable having the container um, registry as the mechanism of delivering? Yes and no. <laughs> some are, some are not. So the reason I'm kind of asking that is from the perspective of multi-config, what we actually, I think, you know, from a Yocto world perspective, right? Not, not the way that containers normally work out in the, in the rest of the world. What we really need is a package that just installs the container, right? So there's no Docker import needed. Right. And so the problem there is now you have to know what super secret path do you put that into and how do you generate the hash that that you know, directory went into and all these other things to finally package that up and make that into just a container package. Um, and you know, this is something I've been looking at. I know Bruce is working on that as well. So um, that's an area that I think we could use some more help. Um, sure. Especially understanding how people are actually really using it and mm -hmm, I think mm -hmm. you, you guys have more experience with your actual customer usage versus theoretical usage. Right. Well, I, yeah. And, and, you know, I will say many of our customers are concerned about Docker repositories and, you know, they want their own private repositories and things like that. And we have some mechanisms to allow them to do that. Um, similarly, for the base operating system, we're all OS tree based for our, our underlying operating system, and we're now rolling out a feature to allow them to kind of self host that. Um, and as far as getting the containers bundled in, we actually have external tooling uh, that, that our, our customers use called Horizon Core Builder, and it basically takes the pre built binary, pulls it apart, puts everything back in. So, um, you know, we kind of sidestep that issue. We do still support people doing Yocto builds, but at the moment, I think if one of our, our customers came and said, I want to do a Yocto build, but also at the same time include the, the containers, I think our answer would be, well, you could do that, but you got to figure it out on your own. <laughs> we, don't, we don't have a good answer for that, for sure. Okay, All right, anybody else? Do we have any online questions? Uh, do we not run into two different S bombs? One for the host OS build with Yocto that runs the container runtime, and the other one for the container content mostly composed with artifacts from a registry such like Docker Hub. Absolutely, we would, um, and that's where the whole multi config comes in, right? Everything I built here was just the container payloads, right? I didn't I didn't capture the details about building the base operating system, but right, you know, the way I did it, they were two completely separate builds, and you know, I would have to maintain the, the the downloads and the shared state and the license manifests and things like that independently. If you use the multi config, the you know, it's still actually separate builds from within you know the bitbake world but the the, the license files and everything uh, are going to be maintained properly by that multi-config setup all right anybody else very good well thank you guys all for your time i appreciate you coming enjoy lunch